ushering in a new era for global development. The theme of this year's BRICS Summit has been echoed by the participating leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Cooperation agreements have been signed in several key areas, including vaccines, food security, trade, digital economy, and aerospace. Although the international situation is constantly changing, the trend of open development will not. The desire to work together to face challenges will not change. With current complexities like the pandemic and geopolitics, BRICS members and other emerging countries are faced with increasing challenges in development. In September last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed a Global Development Initiative, or GDI, calling on the world to stay committed to the development issues such as poverty alleviation, food security, COVID-19 response and vaccines, climate change, and more. Bridging the development divide, GDI is seen as a comprehensive promotion of practical cooperation. Global development is a common aspiration for all. What is going to be the role of the media? Tune in to my conversation with thinkers and practitioners from the Global South in a special program on World Insight. Hello, and welcome to Global Development Initiative, Media Responsibility and Action Plan. I'm your host, Tian Wei. This is a major event taking place on the sidelines of the 2022 BRICS Summit. Global development aspirations are shared by everyone. Human development and international efforts to reduce poverty and also inequality while improving education, health, and also global development job opportunities are crucial for everyone. The United Nations puts forward the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is a great list of tasks for everyone to work together through cooperation. In response to that and the common agenda of global development, China puts forward the Global Development Initiative, calling on all parties to work together to stay on the goals of global development. But now the question is, when the world is changing so fast, how can we, the media, play our roles? How can we stay on top of the grand transformation taking place every day and be able to focus on our responsibility and actions? These are profound questions for everyone. Luckily, I have invited a panel of thinkers and practitioners today. So let's together brainstorm and take actions. Joining us today, Xue Lan, Dean of the Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. Marcella Musa Bellu, Executive Director of the Albanian Institute for Globalization Studies. Yao Yan, Director of the China Center for Economic Research at Peking University. Himadrish Suban, Chairman of the Confederation of Young Leaders in India. Zhao Hai, Director of the International Political Studies Program at the National Institute for Global Strategy at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And Leonardo Atuch, Editor-in-Chief of Brazil 24-7. When we talk about the Global Development Initiative, one of the important things is how can we approach from the current global governance system. On that, earlier I talked to Marcus Choiho, who is the president of the New Development Bank, and let's listen to this excerpt. So I think the topic for the BRICS Summit this year is a very precise one. This is exactly what the world needs, more quality in terms of its development. The original members have very different backgrounds, different political systems. They're even in different stages of economic development, but they share this common goal of providing resources for infrastructure and sustainable development. So in spite of their differences, they come together and they build on interests of, in which they shared views. Although the challenges that we're living now are unprecedented, the important thing is, is that structurally, 
the change is happening. Emerging economies are becoming more and more relevant. That is why we are so hopeful for uh, the future. And although the, everything is very difficult, every, every challenge is there, the vision is very important. And the vision, and the vision for being building a pre -pre premier uh, 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 development institution for emerging economies is holding on. I think it's expanding and it's been, um, um, uh, I mean, reality is proving uh, that the new development bank is indeed a very uh, key uh, player in this new scenario. That is Marcus Choiho, the president of the new development bank. So let me ask you, Professor Xue, if I could, the new development initiative, there are many grand goals, but the question really is, is it slogan or is it really aspirations for implementations? Professor Xue Lan. Indeed, this is a, a, an aspiration for action. I think as we all know that since the, the UN SDG being proposed, I think all countries have been sort of trying to really implement the plan. I think that um, uh, you know over the years uh, since 2015, many countries have put out various plans, various action, uh, you know, initiatives. So I think that um, the, the critical thing is that you know how do we uh, prioritize various activities? Uh, I think that uh, you know of course development initiatives are often distracted by many things. For example, uh, geopolitical uh, conflicts and the pandemics and so on. Mm. But, but I think ultimately, we all know that without, you know, without that economic and social development, many of these issues, the challenges we face, we will not be able to resolve them. So I think the action is better than worse. So we need to work together mm. to push for the SDGs. Several years have already passed. So we need to accelerate our efforts in order to really achieve SDGs by 2030. Accelerate the efforts, that's the key phrase I seem to catch. But uh, Ms. Masabalia from uh, uh, Albania, you have been doing research about globalization. Uh, there are ill effects of globalization we have all noticed. So how, during this process of global development, how can we avoid some of the earlier mistakes? You're correct. There also some of us who say that uh, globalization as we know it is finished, but it's another stage, it's a new stage of globalization. Yes, we might have difficulties along the way, but we are still interconnected. Uh, on the other hand, I would like to echo what uh, Professor Lan Shue said. Uh, I totally agree with him saying that uh, the GDI is an action-oriented initiative, while on the other hand, we see a very proactive and a very pragmatic uh, China in this extent, because it was China who initiated it, and on the rest of the world, we are very pleased to see that, because China has a lot to teach to the developing world regarding that. And on the other hand, I would also believe that while furthering and going on with this next step of globalization, mm. we need uh, the GDI because I believe it's a blueprint. While the SDG goals are, as the word says, they are goals, uh, the Global Development Initiative, starting from the eight points which are crucial to it, that uh, China has unfolded, I believe that it's the blueprint on which we have to go ahead. Yeah, it's very true that there should not only be global blueprints, but also action, specific action plans. On that, I want to come to you, Professor, uh, here mm -hmm. in Beijing. Uh, Professor Yao, you know, you are an economist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have been also doing a lot of research uh, and education to mm -hmm. the global south. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about, at this point, so many challenges, including the economic difficulties the world is facing because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have enough strength and resolve to really focus on global development? You know, over the last uh, several years, uh, the whole world has been fully occupied by the pandemic, by geopolitical conflicts. And uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, the global development goals have been lost in this process. So it's just uh, on time for China to propose this. I think there is uh, another significance uh, when China proposes. This uh, can bring uh, more attention to South-South uh, cooperation. Mm. Right? Uh, countries uh, in the global South 
can exchange experience, uh, can change lessons, can exchange uh, technologies, and aiming at uh, a common goal. I mean, the industrial countries are now occupied by other agendas, right? But uh, for the global south, uh, as an economist, I fully believe that <laughs> the ultimate solution to all the problems is economic and uh, human development. So uh, GDI is just on time. Mm. But we look at what is actually some of the tools if we talk about uh, the plan and the action plan, mm. right? So what are some of the most crucial tools? I want to go back to uh, Professor Xue Lan on that. Professor Xue, you've been doing research internationally about digitalization and also both governance, technology, as well as how developing Global South will be able to catch up and even to a certain extent be the front runner. Do you see that trend is happening if we are saying technology is one of the tools we have in hand? Indeed, I, I see there's a huge potential uh, for the new uh, technologies, particularly the ones that's been so-called the fourth industrial revolution technologies. I think many of those technology has huge potential to transform uh, the development process in developing countries. You know, particularly I think, of course, digital transformation is the key. Uh, I think that the, the critical thing is that I think that we need to find ways to stimulate innovation. Uh, both, I think that, you know, cutting edge, you know, innovations, but also I think many of the, you know, sort of so really sort of, uh, 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 sort of ground uh, level, sort of the, um, um, more of the, uh, the maintained daily sort of innovations, that those have to be combined together to accelerate the uh, economic and social development. The other things also, I think, related to innovation is education, education in all fronts. Mm. I think that uh, we are entering the knowledge economy and the, uh, the learning process is critical for all countries. Digital divide is one of the fact that is already taking place in the world. For emerging economies, developing countries, all of us, we know this. It's taking place in our neighborhood. It's taking place in the community. So how do we, during this process, avoid these, uh, you know, some of the mistakes that uh, of similar quality already being made before and be able to avoid that right now? You're absolutely right. I think digital divide is a critical uh, I think, uh, you know, challenge we face. I, I think that at the same time, we need to actually to let the government play a more important role in driving the technology application. I think we certainly, the market is playing a critical role in, in, in sort of pushing for innovation, but at mm -hmm. the same time, the government can play a more important role in making the diffusion of technology. And here, I think the government policy can play a critical role to, to bridge the uh, so-called digital divide. And, mm. and I think the other thing is also we need to think about how actually uh, countries can collaborate together to form partnership, to learn from each other, to bridge those uh, digital gaps. I think everybody would agree with you when it comes to partnership. That's why we're all sitting here today, right, mm -hmm. Professor Xie? But about the role of government, is that the alternative or is that the solution? Let me ask you, Mr. Marsabelli, uh, coming from Albania, do you agree with what Professor Xie just proposed? Well, absolutely, because we need a top-bottom approach. If there is no uh, government prospects, if, if there is no government communication, and of course, at the other hand, we need these uh, projects to be multilateral, not only top to bottom, but also sideways. So that is why uh, we need this kind of communication about the digital divide, because uh, no one should be left behind. We all need to be integrated in this advancement that are currently happening already. On the other hand, of course, why not? Government and public sector can cooperate on that. Yeah, I'm sure Professor Yao would agree with you on that because as an economist, you always work with different parties, including the private sector. Professor Yao, what are the players? Uh, well, I, I think for innovation, uh, the market should play the critical role, but we cannot ignore the role of innovation the Innovation with sustainable development in mind. Yes. I mean, take an example of China, right? When China developed clean uh, energy, the government played a huge role uh, in this process. 
but now China is uh, the largest producer of solar, power, uh, solar panel equipment. All right, uh, so uh, government industrial policy mm -hmm. played a huge role. Of that. But in terms of innovation, actually private companies uh, played a, a role. So this is a perfect example of uh, a public or private partnership. Mm. Having said that, though, what do you think, uh, as an economist, of uh, the digital digital divide, and will you know economies like ours, emerging and developing ones, who we are mm. inviting today, be able to provide some solutions during the process of development? Uh, well, yes, uh, there is a digital divide, but uh, to me, I think for developing countries, uh, they could uh, leap forward right, using the technology mm. to advance. Uh, their economic growth. Uh, for example, uh, now we have this uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, communication technology, right? Um, I think uh, that will enable uh, many residents uh, in developing the South to get access to the market and also buy things from the market, right? Mm. So it seems that there is a chance for those countries to, to jump over some steps of industrialization and they go directly to a digital economy. Mm. Let me go to you, uh, Mr. Suvan from India, uh, both uh, uh, about your, uh, your uh, stories for a global development agenda. So I think that uh, through the uh, multilateral and plurilateral organizations and initiatives such as BRICS, we are uh, paving a right way in consolidating the global development agenda by uniting 2.7 billion plus population of India by harnessing their true potential and paving a community of a shared future for mankind. Mm. I think India is marching ahead in uh, shaping these agendas and these discourse in the coming days and the months to come. So I'm very confident that through the process of uh, such development agendas, we are on the right track of uh, establishing our cooperation at large. Mm. Mr. Atushi, as an editor-in-chief of a major glo uh, global media in Brazil, what do you make of the, uh, you know, the big topic of global development? I believe that uh, the challenge that we face today is to uh, improve uh, the communication uh, between our countries, because I guess that, uh, as, as, a, as an editor, the challenge we face is that we are always reprodu reproducing, uh, I would say, uh, news agents from Western countries uh, who sometimes have some prejudice uh, toward the BRICS countries. And uh, we also depend on big techs from uh, Western countries as well. And I think we should improve uh, cooperation within media groups and also to have a dream of creating uh, big text from the global south. Then let me go to you, Mr. Zhao, about your thoughts. Um, from our perspective as a, a think tank doing research on geopolitical and geoeconomic competitions these days, uh, it's interesting on the one hand, as Professor Xie pointed out, there's destruction uh, from develop global development because of these competitions. However, on the other hand, we saw competition uh, between China, United States, and other Western countries. And that competition forced them to come up with uh, developing uh, projects like uh, the Build Back Better World, uh, or later on, uh, Europeans come up with European Gateway. And then later on, recently, uh, they came up with the PGII, Partner for Global Infrastructure and mm. Investment. I think without China's uh, BRI, and also without BRICS, uh, the new development bank, and so on, and AIIB, I would mention, uh, that the West will not pay enough attention to the deficit of investment and global development financing in those countries. So I think maybe a little bit of competition is good for everyone. Global development is a common aspiration for all. What is going to be the role of the media? Tune in to my conversation with thinkers and practitioners from the global south in a special program on World Insight. Well, it seems that, ladies and gentlemen, through our discussion until now, we've already figured out some tools. Technology is one, even though it could be double-end sword. On the other hand, 
Uh, there's also the competition that if it is being used well, it could be one of the tools for all of us to improve and concentrate on South-South cooperation and the development in the global South. Having said that though, let me also ask you about an, another aspect, uh, Professor uh, Yao, uh, about uh, global development initiative. Uh, we see uh, to certain extent that the global South are developing with some shared goals, but yeah. also with lessons and experiences that can be shared. Mm. When we talk about the GDI mm. uh, proposed by China, for example, how much will it be of reference to mm. the other emerging and developing countries mm. in serving them mm. uh, to work to the best for their own future? Uh, every time when I met our new students, I always say, look, you come to China, you all want to learn something from China, mm. but uh, no, China is only a mirror, uh, right? You're going to see in the mirror yourself, right? Uh, of course, China plays a role to show you, but the most important thing is that uh, through the mirror of China, you see a better self. Mm -hmm. You understand better yourself, right? Uh, so this is kind of a metaphor. I, I think China. I love that metaphor. Mm -hmm. Did some of the students uh, come up to you and say, Professor Yao, mm -hmm. I see better about myself. Uh, well, I, uh, I see clearer yeah, about myself through uh, this so, mirror. Several of my students, uh, when they uh, wrote their thesis, uh, they actually uh, tried to analyze their own country's problem through the lens of China, mm. how China solved that problem in the past, right? So China's experience is just a fresh. Right? It's just so, uh, so close to other developing countries, mm. right? So they can learn a lot from uh, China's uh, experience for good or, or, or for bad, right? The decision is in the hands of our students, right? Mm. How to uh, use China as uh, a lesson for their own As a reference. Reference, right. Maybe in that right. way. Right. Do you agree with that, <laughs> uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Musabelli? Exactly. But, uh, but I was thinking of, about that since the moment the professor said it. It's, it's fantastic. It's really, it's nice. really what, uh, what I was, uh, food for the thought, basically. And I can testify to that because several years ago, I was a PhD student in Shaman University. Oh. So, <laughs> so yes, I can testify to that. I can testify to the words of my professors in China. I and still like, want to dig a little I, bit more about your Xiamen days. What did you learn? You know, how was it serving as a mirror for you? Oh, uh, I studied world economy for four years. And then after I finished my degree in Xiamen, I returned back to my country where I found it with some other scholars, the institute I'm representing today. I have to say it was a unique experience. I could go days speaking about it. But again, as professor said, it is a mirror. We need that mirror. But another expression I want to point out, China's development model is great. It is a miracle, as the word said. However, there's another expression that says, I can show you the path, but I cannot walk it for you. Mm. So developing countries can see Chinese path, but every nation's path is different. Our realities are different. Our economic conditions at the moment are different. For example, I'm speaking to you from a very small country in Southeast Europe, and in a matter of two months, our inflation got to 9%. Mm. So things change so much, so quickly with what is going on around the world. So yes, we have a wonderful path, but we have to walk it. Developing countries have to walk it with programs, with cooperation, with know-how and everything else. And Mr. Suwan, uh, your thoughts on that? Yes, indeed. I was just listening to Professor Yao and uh, Madam Marcela. So in fact, I have a similar story and I'm one of the beneficiary of the South-South cooperation. I completed a master's program from Peking University from the oh. Institute of South-South Cooperation. Oh. I'm a student oh. of a master's in public administration. <laughs> so I think that this is a living testimony and living example of China's great contribution to mankind and uh, the way China is strengthening the bonds of South-South cooperation.
Mm. And well, as uh, uh, Ms. Marcela rightly pointed out that uh, China is uh, success, China's growth model is a miracle for the world citizenry. We in India are also inspired by our neighbor. And in fact, when uh, I received an offer that uh, if uh, I can study at the Peking University, so some of my colleagues suggested me to why not uh, go to the West and uh, pursue tertiary education. But I said that uh, when, uh, well, uh, within a, a range of 5,000 kilometers at our neighbor's door, we have one of the uh, world's best university. Why should I look at the West? Asia itself is a powerful tool for promoting education and cultural cooperation. So I, I went forward and pursued this incredible program from this uh, finest institution of the world. And I'm really yeah. grateful for this opportunity to China and this uh, Institute for South South Cooperation. So I think that uh, I'm uh, proud to be an alumni and also beneficiary of China's vision of promoting- <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> Great. Uh, I think uh, Professor Yao now is cracking his mind, trying to think what kind of thesis did uh, Mr. Suwan wrote? <laughs> I wrote it on China in the relation itself. Yes, but you know, it's, 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 it's two ways, isn't it? It's right. both uh, coming to China and also Chinese young people going to the other countries. You know, Professor Xue Lan earlier uh, from uh -huh. Tsinghua University, they also have program to attract uh, young people coming from the global south right. uh, and many of the uh, emerging and developing countries also providing education for young people from other countries in the global south these kinds of two-way streets or multiple streets right. are providing us with a lot of opportunities to know one another uh, professor Zhao, mr Zhao, do you have a do you have a, a similar experience uh well i have a different uh, experience but I can compare or um, sure, uh, try to compare the, the, the yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, compare resumes. Uh, I actually studied in the West. Uh, I studied at the University of Chicago in the United States. And uh, uh, I think we can al also learn from the developed countries about their trajectory towards modernity. Uh, mm -hmm. On the past, however, there are various ways towards modernization and industrialization. And uh, I think it's uh, very um, uh, educational at the same time, uh, also help us learning the curve and trying to overcome some of uh, the uh, uh, traps along the way, because developed mm -hmm. countries also fell into uh, here and there, some of the bad things that, that they've committed, like uh, environmental uh, degradation, uh, and also, you know, immigration and all kinds of problems uh, along the way. So I think Global South can learn from their experience, their success and their failures, and we can improve our way of modernizing ourselves. Particularly, I, I think that's the wisdom of GDI because in that is suggested that um, not only we should learn from each other, uh, but also, you know, we should put this into action. And also we should be people focused. That is the key because in the South, we have a different culture we have different history and we can use that, utilize that and leverage that and to uh, have a very different path, but maybe uh, in a way faster path towards uh, mm. modernization uh, well and develop, it developing is, ourselves. It is about being inclusive, not exclusive. That's what exactly. your point is, it's, it's excellent point. I go to you uh, also uh, from Brazil, uh, Mr. Atucci. I remember, you know, going to Brazil for the very first time for the climate change summit, it, it dazzled me about how people there, you know, devote their attention to the protection of nature. And this is something I see the strength of developing countries and the global South that at the development stage, uh, uh, rapid economic development stage, we already realize the importance of doing all these things that while other developed economies only later walk back and realize that there are things they should do and didn't. So I think, how much do you think we'll be able to use this? Uh, by the way, if you study in Peking University of Tsinghua, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Atushi. Brazil uh, is one of the biggest food uh, producers in the world. So what we need to balance is food production and also protection of the environment. So uh, I think that uh, the thing that will be at the center stage in Brazil will be sustainable development. Uh, everyone looks to the Amazon and see the risks that we face today. Uh, is uh, I, I think that everyone agree that Brazil should uh, protect better uh, the rainforest 
uh, than it's doing uh, today. And also avoiding, uh, you know, uh, grain production in this area. But I would say that Brazil has a good uh, track record uh, from the past, from uh, the past governments uh, in the way that we were able to, you know, increase food production as well, include uh, being able to protect our, uh, our nature. So uh, Brazil and China uh, have a very uh, strong uh, relationship in this area. And I think uh, it's from, for the mutual benefit for everyone, uh, sustainable uh, production will be at the center in this uh, GDI agenda. At this stage, ladies and gentlemen, what I have noticed is something amazing. There's tremendous chemistry taking place among all our panelists. You know, sometimes we only know about each other or learn about the other party through the third eyes of, you know, the media uh, or the uh, platforms of, uh, developing, develop, of developed economies from the West. Of course, it could be one way that we can got to know each other, but that is not sufficient enough. The directly looking into each other's eyes, for example, what I'm doing right now to Ms. Marcelia, uh, from, from uh, uh, Europe, uh, you know, looking at each other into the eyes, that is something very different. That make us learn much more about each other and be more inspired by each other, isn't it? It's, you are totally correct when you say that. Uh, we hope that as soon as this pandemic is over, people to people exchange will restart at a faster pace or as before. So we can again in person see eye to eye again with each other. I totally agree with you. We need to cooperate with each other. We need to know more about, about each other realities. We need to create a culture of mutual acquaintance between us, between our culture, between our customs, our histories, and so on. In order, in order to do that, we need to intensify our exchanges. On the other hand, I have noticed that, especially from this side of the world where I stand, the most common problem are misperceptions. Since today's panel is about the role of the media, I can say what the media from this side uh, is portraying about China, and it's not always flattering, and sometimes it's not always true. Many media outlets in here are more interested in creating heat than shedding light. They are more interested in uh, attracting, uh, let's say, eyeballs instead of actually analyzing what the situation is. So yes, we need to cooperate in order to eliminate these misperceptions. Mr. Atsushi, you're from the media, not just me. Uh, you, <laughs> you are also from the field. So say something right now uh, uh, to respond to uh, the wonderful lady who just expressed her views and also suggests that there should be more better understanding of misperceptions. Yes, uh, well, let me say how we try to work here from uh, here in Brazil. Uh, we have a very strong cooperation with uh, Xinhua Agency, for example. We also use uh, material from the Sputnik Agency from, from, from Russia. Uh, we should have better uh, cooperation with India uh, outlets than we have now. Uh, why uh, I'm saying this? Because uh, it's not good to be dependent on, you know, Reuters News Service or AP or even um, uh, France Press or Deutsche Welle. Because what we see today is that the world is becoming divided. Uh, from one side, you have the NATO countries. From the other side, you have the countries from the global south. And the message uh, sometimes that we see is that uh, if you are not with us, you are against us. And I really believe that we, we should be in a world of cooperation. And I think that the countries from the global south provide a better understanding of you know, the conflicts that we face today. We do not want to limit it to just the media conversation because we have many other thinkers and also practitioners. So Mr. Zhao, tell me more about your thoughts about, you know, how is your view now regarding the Global South Development, uh, Global Development Initiative 
uh, to the role of the media that you see? Media, um, particularly in the West, the nature of the media is very much uh, depend on uh, how much it sells. So that's why in the age of globalization, anxiety, fear, uh, mm -hmm. smearing uh, China or you know, other negative stories sells more than positive stories. Uh, and, and that's why, I, 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 particularly in this very competitive, uh, polarized political environment, those media are actually pushing uh, this wave of di divide uh, between peoples, between countries in the world. And that's very, um, I think, unfortunate. Uh, moving forward, I think for South-South cooperation and particularly for media that takes the responsibility to promote developing, uh, developing countries' interests, it's very important to focus on the successful stories and positive stories and also focus on the suffering uh, the misery of the people who are still in poverty, who are still in hunger, and affected by today's uh, all kinds of uh, uh, difficulties. So that's why I think responsibility uh, is uh, very important in these days for the news media uh, mm. to focus on the poor people. Mm. Mr. Suwan, your thoughts on that with your India experience? I think that being an ancient civilization, uh, both China and India, we have been a practitioner of the philosophy of that world is one family. And as, as being an Indian, we believe in the philosophy of Pasudheva Kutumbakam, which means that whole world is one family. And even as a Chinese saying goes, that a single tree does not make a forest, while a hundred flowers in full blossom bring spring to the garden. So I think that under the new turbulent circumstances, it is all more important for uh, the uh, global community to pursue development with an open doors and boost cooperation with open arms. Mr. Atuji, you know, trillionaire, billionaire is a story sell, right? Uh, well, the global development story, you know, of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the global South, for example, about hunger, about uh, uh, natural disaster, might not sell, uh, quote unquote, uh, for uh, the longer term, you know, that's just human nature. But, you know, as a media worker ourselves, how do you see this uh, apparent dilemma? How do you see the importance to inform and inform with a balanced global uh, reality and vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, you know, what some consider as the nature of the media? Well, uh, it's a very good question. And I totally agree uh, with uh, Marcelo when she said that, you know, media outlets should not be you know, uh, only looking to eyeballs, audience, and these things. But uh, from our experience, what I can tell you is that our readers and our um, viewers, because we have the website and the TV also, uh, they are really interested in geopolitics because uh, I think we, we were able to create a culture uh, in our, our audience that we cannot understand our country if we cannot understand the world and the conflicts and what's going on. Uh, and why do we have, you know, uh, great powers fostering wars, conflicts, and why do we have the BRICS? Why, do we, uh, why are we going to a country when we see uh, for example, NATO versus BRICS. And everyone agrees that uh, Brazil has been going through a lot of turbulence in the, in, in the last years. And it's all related to international interests also. So I think uh, what happened in Brazil in the last four or five or six years uh, opened uh, a window for everyone to, you know, study more about international relations, geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said before, I think that now, even if you are uh, from the left, the center or the right, many people believe that, you know, the BRICS can provide a way for win-win cooperation. Mm. And now, and, and it's very important to see what's going on, not only in the BRICS countries, but also in Africa. Right. Uh, other regions to see how these countries are finding solutions to, you know, eliminate poverty or or try to eliminate at least. Right. Before we go, may I have every one of you 
to say with us, uh, to share with us one sentence or two about your aspirations for global development. What about the world that you want to see and the media could help? Let's start from Professor Yao. Well, as an educator, I think uh, my priority is to train better students. And uh, in ISCAT, our institute, to train better government officials uh -huh. uh, uh, who are devoted uh, to economic development and human development in our own country. Mm. Mr. Sovan from India. I think that being the chair of one of India's largest youth organization, uh, my main objective is to create more young leaders who could promote global peace and global development in the near future. Mm -hmm. Hopefully also with the help of the media in that regard. Yeah, def uh, definitely, yes. media plays a very crucial. Ms. Masalia. But from where I stand, I just want to see open economy, open trade, less barriers. Of course, I had the Institute for Globalization, so I, I would like to see that deepened, and I would like to see that deepened all way around politics, economics, exchange, academia, media, and everything else. Yeah. Mr. Atushi? Well, I agree with everyone, global peace, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, but I will add uh, respect for uh, each country or each uh, sovereignty. Uh, it's a very important world. Right. Uh, you know, each country should be able to uh, develop its own resources. Uh, and also, I would say, coming from a multicultural uh, country as Brazil, no to any form of racism or discrimination. I think this is very important in our times. Yeah. Uh, to respect every culture and every individual. Mm. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Zhao. Well, um, as a think tank, uh, I hope we can do our job to connect with other think tanks around the globe to refocus on development and use development as a weapon to fight uh, all kinds of challenges that we face today. Well, you see, ladies and gentlemen, we started with a question, how? to implement the Global Development Initiative and our common aspirations. And we are finishing up with real action plans and certainly real actions from all fields of life. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate that. And that brings us to the end of this special edition of our program, the Global Development Initiative, uh, Media Responsibility, and action plan. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team and the organizers. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. <laughs>